starting off our list today, we have Athens, Texas, home to Reverend Fuller, who it seems took a dark turn the day the circus rolled into town. It is said that on that day, a wagon carrying a cargo of monkeys tipped over and the animals escaped into the woods, where some were later captured by Reverend Fuller. Locals tell that Fuller kept the monkeys in a cage on a plot of land he owned called Fuller Park, where eventually he began using them for highly unethical experimentation. It was said for years he tortured the animals until they eventually died and were buried on the land. Later, when Fuller passed, he and his wife were buried in the park as well. Many locals who had heard the rumors of Fuller's heinous acts went out to explore the land driven by curiosity. Many also recounted that while exploring the area, they had found a series of entrances to underground tunnels, all of which eventually met up underground, forming the shape of a pentagram. It has also been said that the road leading into the park and the park itself, where the monkeys along with Fuller and his wife are buried is extremely haunted. Not by Fuller's ghost, but rather the ghosts of the monkeys who had to endure the unforgiving nature of Fuller's torture under the guise of scientific exploration. Next, we have the tragedy of McCarthy, Alaska, an event that took place in 1983 in which a man named Hastings had planned to wipe out the entire population of the small town. About eight months prior to the incident, Hastings had moved to the small mining town that had a population of just 22 people. On February 29th, Hastings went over to his friend Chris Richards' home and fired two projectiles at the man. One hit him just above his eye and the other in the neck. Richards was, however, However, able to escape after defending himself with a kitchen blade and ran to get help. After firing at Richards, Hastings went to the airstrip where most of the town had gathered, awaiting the weekly mail delivery. He hit seven individuals with projectiles from a handheld weapon. Six passed and one suffered severe injury. When Hastings was eventually apprehended, 30 kilometers outside of the town, he admitted that he had planned on taking out the entire population but was ultimately unsuccessful. He had also wanted to hijack the mail plane so that he could fly to Glen Allen where he would steal a truck and blow himself up along with the Trans Alaska Oil Pipeline Pump Station. Hastings was sentenced to 634 years in prison for his crimes. Next on our list today, we have San Geronimo de Juarez, Mexico, a town with a population of just 7,300 in which Oscar Flores took the lives of 12 individuals, including a member of his own family. The incident started in the man's home where he ended the life of his nephew with a kitchen blade. When police arrived on the scene, Flores was able to escape after he beat one officer with a large rock and stole the weapon off another. Flores then used that weapon to continue his violent rampage, firing at random people throughout the town. Eventually, the townspeople turned on Flores and began chasing him. While trying to outrun them, Flores lost the weapon he had stolen and somehow also lost his clothes. He faced off against the townspeople naked, armed with only a large blade, but when police arrived at the scene, they were able to successfully apprehend Flores, who was badly injured in the process and died in hospital not long after. After his death, it was discovered that seven years prior to his final violent spree, Flores, who had a long history of substance abuse, had taken the life of his brother-in-law as well as five other individuals in Tijuana in the years prior. Next up, we have the 10 hour killing spree that took place in June of 2010 in the small villages of Cumbria in England. It all started early in the morning when 56 year old taxi driver Derek Bird drove to his brother's home and fired 11 projectiles into his head using a handheld weapon. He then drove to the home of his family's tax agent who he thought had been conspiring against him alongside his brother and took the man's life in a similar fashion. After the incident, it seems as though Bird just snapped. He began driving through the villages and towns targeting fellow cattle drivers. One died and three were injured before the police caught wind. Somehow, however, Bird was able to avoid capture. He ditched the cops and continued driving to the next town where again he began firing at random people, ending the lives of another nine men and women and injuring another seven. Eventually, out of gas and out of ammo, missing his vehicle's front tire, Bird got out of his car and began walking into the woods. An hour later, police located his body and it was determined that the man, unable to live with his actions or perhaps face the consequences, had taken his own life. Next up on our list today, we have the small town of Luxeuil located in France and home to just 130 residents. In 1989, it was resident Christian Dornier who landed the town on this list after a mental break led him to a two hour killing spree in which he ended the lives of 14 individuals. While the reality of the incident was shocking after the event took place, many of the locals admitted to having suspected such behavior was inevitable from Dornier. In fact, before the 
the killings even took place, the town's council had suggested to Dornier's family that he should seek psychological help for his disposition. Unfortunately, the family did not listen to the council, and on July 12th, Dornier fired a handheld weapon at his sister and then opened fire on his mother and father. Dornier then got in his car, where he spent the next two hours driving around town, firing his weapon at anyone who crossed his path. He was eventually caught by police after sustaining an injury from an officer's weapon. Dornier did survive the arrest and went to trial, but he was never convicted for his crimes. He was found not guilty by reason of insanity. In 1991, Dornier was checked into a psychiatric hospital in France, where he remains to this day. Next up, we have the small town of Hungford, England, population 5,000. On August 10th of 1984, yet another two-hour killing spree occurred that caused the deaths of seven 17 individuals, including the assailant's family dog, and it also badly injured 15 more. The killing started around 12 p.m. when Michael Robert Ryan abducted a woman from a local park, took her to a secluded area, and fired 13 projectiles at her, ending her life. Michael then fled the scene and made his way back to his neighborhood. When he arrived at his home, he ended the life of the family dog with a projectile and then began loading up his car with handheld weapons. He tried to leave, but his car wouldn't start, so out of anger, he grabbed a can of gasoline, soaked the house, and set it on fire. He then began walking down the road, aiming at anyone he saw. When his mother arrived on the scene, she yelled out to her son, begging him to stop and asking why he was doing what he was doing. He took her life and then fled the area. He eventually took his own life in an empty building that had been surrounded by law enforcement after Michael had been spotted inside. The incident changed the history of England, as shortly after this took place, the country implemented much stricter weapons laws. Next on our list today, we have the unsolved mystery of the Bedford, Massachusetts Highway Killings. In March of 1988, in the small town, which now has a population of around 13,000, young women started to go missing. The disappearances went on for months, but no one could figure out why they were happening. It wasn't until July of that same year that some clarity began to take place, when the bodies of 9 out of the 11 missing women were discovered along the town's highway. It was revealed that the women who had lost their lives all had ties to illegal substance distribution as well as SEX work. Authorities determined that foul play had led to the deaths and a case was opened in the hopes of locating the remaining two missing women and apprehending the killer or killers involved in the deaths of the discovered nine. Unfortunately, neither were ever found and to this day, the case remains an unsolved mystery that continues to baffle law enforcement and plague the small town of Bedford, Massachusetts. Next up and starting off our top three today, we have the small town of Burke Canyon in Idaho. The town was founded in 1887 after rich deposits of silver and lead had been discovered in the area. The architecture of the town was strange, as it had to accommodate the fact that the town had been built inside an incredibly thin canyon, which at some points was only 300 feet wide. But they made it work. For a while, at least, as just a few years after the town opened its doors, it became devastated by an avalanche, which was quickly followed up by a labor strike. A labor strike that ended in a standoff between the miners and the mine owners, during which a projectile accidentally set off a large amount of dynamite, which caused a mill to explode and ended the lives of six people. A few years later, disgruntled miners deliberately blew up another mill, claiming the lives of even more. The incidents were followed up by two massive natural fires, a major flood, and another large avalanche, causing the fall of Burke Canyon, which is known today as nothing much more than a ghost town with some odd buildings and a very violent past. Next up, we have Attica, New York. If the town sounds familiar, it might be because you are vaguely remembering stories you've heard about the town's prison with the same name, which, of course, is what landed the small town on today's list in the first place. The Attica Maximum Security Prison was home to many of the world's most infamous criminals, including American killer David Berkowitz, also known as the Son of Sam, who was responsible for at least eight deaths after which he consumed the flesh of his victims, and Mark David Chapman, the man who killed Beatles legend John Lennon. In 1971, the inmates of the prison, which had been known for its inhumane treatment of the prisoners, took control in an effort to negotiate for better living conditions. The state responded with extreme force, leading to the deaths of at least 34 inmates and nine hostages. Okay, this last town is Baltimore, Maryland, and while it's not small, what happened there is definitely shocking. Have you ever heard of Joe Menthe? Well, if you haven't, listen up, and if you're eating, put it down. Joe Menthe was an American serial 
killer who claimed to have been responsible for violating and ending the lives of 13 separate individuals. If right now you're wondering what he did with the bodies of the deceased, I will tell you, but I'm not happy about it. He made them into burgers and served those burgers to members of the public at his roadside open pit barbecue stand. He was arrested after he asked a friend to help him dispose of a body he had been hiding in a warehouse for over a month. The friend obviously reported him to the police and Joe was convicted of two killings despite confessing to 13. However, research did later confirm three more of his victims. Joe was sentenced to life without parole, thank God, and eventually died in his cell on August 5th of 2017 at the age of 62. Starting off our list today, we have the small town of Fairfax, Virginia with a population of 24,000 people and one bunny man. No, I'm not talking about some strange, unethical scientific experiment that broke the laws of both nature and the law and created some kind of bunny human hybrid situation. What I'm actually talking about is just a bit more grounded in reality. You see, what happened was in the early 1900s, an asylum in the town shut down after local residents caused an uproar over the amount of patients housed at the asylum, as well as its close proximity to their homes. The asylum complied with the wishes of the public by shutting its doors and sending its patients to live out the rest of their days elsewhere, more specifically, Lorton prison. On their way out of town, however, the bus carrying the now prisoners swerved and crashed by Fairfax Bridge and the then patients, now inmates, escaped. All were eventually located except one a patient named Douglas Griffin. And soon after the crash, police began finding skinned, half-eaten rabbits hung up along the bridge. It is also said that one night, a group of young people went out to explore the area and ended up meeting the same fate as the bunnies. Douglas was never found, and in 1970, almost 60 years after the bus crash, many people reported seeing a man in a white suit with bunny ears carrying a very sharp blade. Was it Douglas? A hoax? Or 60 years later, was is it some kind of copycat killer? Next up, we have Quitman, Arkansas. Apparently, y'all got a dog boy you gotta deal with out there. The story begins with a home built in 1890. Few different families lived there before the Bettises moved in. They were a family of three, Floyd and Aileen Bettis and their son, Gerald. Gerald was an absolute Error, especially to animals. Stories began to circulate about Gerald roaming the streets, gathering up stray cats and dogs, which he'd then torment to death. And he grew up to treat his own parents just as badly, keeping them locked away in the attic and even throwing his own father down the stairs at one point, killing him instantly. Gerald was arrested and died in jail, but that's not where his ghost is said to be. Families that have moved into the home since have reported strange strange things happening inside. First of all, it's said that pets just outright refuse to go into this house. Then there's the story of a contractor who came to work on the house and, and saw a large man with long brown hair carrying a cat by its neck, who then began rushing towards the contractor before vanishing into thin air. Many believe the home to be haunted by Gerald Bettis, aka the dog boy. Next, we are headed on up to Gary, Indiana, also known as a serial killer's playground. Once a thriving steel town known as the Magic City, Gary kind of fell off after the local industry began to decline in the 1990s due to competition overseas. Eventually, it turned into somewhat of a ghost town with over 10,000 abandoned and decaying houses far beyond repair lining its empty streets. As is with most abandoned places, the town quickly became a hot spot for arsonists vandals, cult gatherings, and even a serial killer by the name of Darren Van. Between 2013 and 2014, Darren ended the lives of seven different women by forcibly restricting their airways, and six of these women he hid throughout various abandoned homes in the town. The bodies remained hidden, and his crimes remained undetected until police found his final victim lifeless in a motel bathroom. To avoid the death penalty, Van made a deal. Instead of pleading guilty to the one 
one killing, the only killing police had evidence to charge him for, he would plead guilty to seven and bring the police to the homes in which the bodies were stashed to prove that he did in fact commit those crimes. He was instead charged with seven concurrent life sentences without parole. Next on the list is Ojai, California and the tale of the char man. Just south of Ojai lies Camp Comfort County Park, which is full of urban legends and ghost stories like tons. There's a, the ghost of a horsewoman, a headless motorcyclist, there's a vampire skeleton confined in a stone coffin. The list just goes on and on. There's stuff happening at this place. But one of the creepiest urban legends is the one they call Charman. So in 1948, there was a huge fire in the home of a father and his son. They were both horribly burnt before firemen arrived, and it took them a while to get there apparently because by the time they did get there, the father was dead and the son had become completely deranged. He'd hung his father by his feet and skinned him. And the story goes that he just went crazy and then decided to do that. He was like, oh, I'm burnt! I gotta hang my father up and eat his skin. I don't know. I don't know why that was how it goes, but that's apparently how the story goes. He became then this charred, deranged monster and ran off into the woods and started living like Jason Voorhees. He'd come out and attack unsuspecting people. Charman is said to emit a horrible burning smell and only wears bandages over his burnt, peeling skin. Some say he's a ghost. Others say he survived for a while, living on his own in the woods as a deranged psycho, coming out of hiding on occasion to terrorize people. From the Golden to the Lone Star State, it's time to talk about the candy lady who resided in a small Texas town in the early 20th century. While having a candy lady in your area might sound like a pretty sweet deal, it really was the complete opposite for those living in this particular town. In fact, the candy lady is a story that apparently haunts people of Texas to this day. So who the hell is she? Well, she was a woman with a very sinister N.O. It is said that this woman would leave candy on her windowsills each night in an effort to lure young people over to her home. When they got close, she would snatch them up. During this time, many young members of the town were reported missing, and one farmer reported having found rotten teeth strewn along his fields. That is so gross. A sheriff had also been found with his eyes clawed out and his pockets stuffed with candy, and soon after, a young boy was found in a very similar state. If this doesn't tell you not to take candy from strangers. I really don't know what does. I just, I can't help you then. Now we move on to Ellicott City in Maryland. This town has a very unsettling urban legend, that of the Blink Man of Ilchester Tunnel, also known as the Flickergeist. Ilchester Tunnel is said to be haunted by the vengeful spirit of a homeless man who was hit by an oncoming train in the 1900s. Now, if you feel like it, you can summon Blink Man to haunt you rather easily. All you need to do is head to the tunnel at midnight, of course, it's always midnight, and stare into it for a whole hour. When 1am hits, it's said that you'll start to see the ghostly, tormented face of the Blink Man, and then every time you blink from that moment on, you'll see him creeping closer and closer to you when your eyes are closed. Now, personally, I wouldn't suggest doing this, even without the possibility of being haunted by a disgruntled homeless ghost the rest of your life. Just don't think it's a great idea to stand staring off into a tunnel in the middle of the night on active train tracks. Moving on up and over to Exeter, Rhode Island, home to many of history's New England witches, the first of which was executed in 1647. Fast forward to 1982, let's talk about the pure evil that is the final days of a young woman named Mercy Brown. Was she a witch or was she just educated? Or was she actually a vampire? Well, here's the thing. In her life, Mercy had watched both her mother and sister pass from tuberculosis, the same disease that Mary Mary suffered from leading up to her final day. Due to all the deaths surrounding Mary and the Brown family, the small town of Exeter began to believe that she might have been a witch, or were still a vampire. Why? No clue. What did they do about it? Well, after her burial, they dug her up and burned her heart and her liver to ashes, and then they force fed those ashes to her surviving brother who died just two months later. If that's not dark enough, it is said that Mercy Brown's ghost still haunts the cemetery in which her decimated grave resides. Next on the list is Tagus, North Dakota. Now, Tagus has long been abandoned. It's a ghost town that once thrived in the 1900s. There's not a whole lot left of it now, just a handful of rundown homes, uh, and of course, a stairway to hell. At one time, there was a Lutheran church in the ghost town. 
was burnt down in the early 2000s by hoodlums, the abandoned church was always said to be a real spooky place. Satan worshippers were said to practice dark rituals there. It's said if you stand in the exact spot where the church once stood, you can faintly hear screams coming from the souls that were once damned to hell. Other sights to see at the abandoned town of Tagus include, but are not limited to, a ghost train, which some have seen chugging along the old abandoned train tracks. Love the idea of a ghost train. Ghostly hellhounds, regular old ghosts, and ticked off local residents who may not be too pleased with mass amounts of people descending on the ghost town to catch a glimpse of the paranormal. From the stairway to hell in North Dakota to the gates of hell in Thornton, Colorado. What's next? Highway to hell in ACDC? Anyways, the gates are said to be located just off of Riverdale Road, a relatively short road in Thornton. But you know what they say, short road? Big scary mansion containing the gateway to hell. The mansion is said to have gained its entryway status after a man buried his wife, son, and daughters alive on the property. But these were not the first deaths to occur on the lot. In previous years, many people had been killed and strung up around the mansion as well. We are not sure if the madman responsible for all of these deaths was outright trying to summon the devil, but it appears that when you do that much evil in such a short amount of time, it just kind of happens. Along with the decrepit old mansion's gateway status, the ghost man's wife is said to haunt the property as well, along with a pack of ghost dogs. Many people who have attempted to visit the mansion have reported hearing whispers and screams, experiencing car trouble, feeling a chill, and seeing phantom vehicles and disappearing men on the road. Pretty creepy, I would not recommend going there. We're rounding out the list with the town of Cumberland. So this small town in Rhode Island has an urban legend that may have been part of the inspiration for Freddy Krueger in A Nightmare on Elm Street. So campers at Camp Curina Karana, couldn't figure out how to pronounce that. All you Camp Karana campers, let me know in the comments. But uh, people at this camp have told stories for decades, apparently going all the way back to the early 20th century. So the tale of Fingernail Freddy. Freddy was a farmer who lived in a small log cabin with his wife and children. He was a quiet man who kept mostly to himself, but little hoodlums were always running around on his land and messing with his crops. Well, one day Freddy just, he had enough. He decided he was gonna scare these men menaces off his property once and for all by filling a shotgun with rock salt and firing at them. This did scare them off, but not for good. When Freddy was out in town, the young vandals returned and burned his house down, with Freddy's family still inside. Freddy returned to find his cabin engulfed in flames and tried to rush in to save his loved ones, getting severely burned in the process. So Freddy ran off into the woods, living a secluded life. But every once in a while, he'd come out to terrorize young boys at Camp Curina, a disfigured monster with a burnt face and incredibly long nails. We're gonna start the list with Waynesville, Ohio. This is said to be one of the most haunted towns in the state, which is saying a lot for Ohio. Waynesville, Ohio is founded way back in 1797, and it has quite the history and its fair share of spooky stories. So sure, folks flock here for the antiques and the annual sauerkraut festival, but it's also known as a haunt for ghost hunters. You'll hear some odd sounds in the old buildings. You'll see shadowy figures peeking out of windows. With more than 15 spots rumored to be haunted, Waynesville has no shortage of creepy tales. Like the Hamill House Inn, for example. Staff here have reported seeing a mysterious man in room four, and some say a young salesman vanished there ages ago possibly meeting a dark end. Then there's the Stetson House, where Louisa Stetson, Lyric, supposedly still roams, dressed to the nines in old-fashioned gear. There's also the former friend's boarding home, now a museum, where you might hear the sounds of ladies bustling about as if they're cooking up a storm, even though there's no kitchen anymore. Now we move on to Mansfield, Ohio. This place isn't just said to be haunted by, you know, lame ghosts who will just pass right through your body if they ever try to punch you. It's also haunted by a big, scary, hairy, orange-eyed beast referred to as orange eyes. And you wouldn't want to get punched by orange eyes. But let's start with the haunted stuff. One of the most famous haunted locations in Mansfield is the Ohio State Reformatory. Known for its imposing architecture and eerie atmosphere, once a prison, the reformatory is said to be haunted by the spirits of former inmates who suffered 
under harsh conditions. Visitors have reported strange noises, apparitions, and unsettling feelings while exploring it. And aside from the reformatory, Mansfield is also home to, again, tales of a cryptid known as the Orange Eyes, described as a creature with glowing orange eyes and a menacing presence. Sightings of the Orange Eyes have been reported in the wooded areas surrounding the city. Some believe it to be a Bigfoot-like creature. Others think it could be paranormal in some way. Some even believe it to be extraterrestrial in origin. Next up, we have Boston Mills, aka Helltown. This is kind of like the Chernobyl of Ohio. So Helltown, Ohio, within the boundaries of Boston Township is full, and I do mean full, of eerie legends and ghost stories. It was once a thriving community known as Boston Mills, but this area faced an abrupt evacuation in the early 70s at the hands of the U.S. government, purportedly to establish the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Now the empty homes, the abandoned buildings and desolate streets that are left behind have this eerie vibe about them. You see, some locals insist that the evacuation wasn't solely because of the government's land claim. There are stories about much darker reasons. Apparently there was toxic contamination with contaminants seeping into the soil. There are also stories about mutated animals and even people lingering around in the old abandoned homes. Not only that, but after the evacuation happened, there are said to have been satanic rituals carried out in the abandoned town. So, lots going on. Next up, we have Athens, Ohio, which has multiple haunted spots. There's a haunted abandoned asylum, a haunted cemetery, even the university is haunted. And there's more cemeteries, which are also all haunted. Every place in this town has ghosts. Half the population who lives here aren't even alive. Now, the haunted reputation mostly comes from its history with the former Athens Lunatic Asylum, now known as the Ridges, which is actually part of Ohio University's campus. The asylum's grounds still have old cemeteries where former patients were buried. One of the creepiest stories about the asylum is the story of Margaret Schilling. She was a former resident who died in the attic in 1979, and she was left there for so long that her decomposing body left a stain on the floor that remains to this very day. Wilson Hall, a dorm on Ohio University's campus, is rumored to be built on top of an old cemetery. The fourth floor of Wilson Hall is said to be haunted, with reports of apparitions, strange noises, and slamming doors. There's also a rumor about a student who took their own life in one of the rooms there. In addition to the Ridges and Wilson Hall, several cemeteries in the Athens area are rumored to be haunted, including Sims, Haynes, Hanning, Cuckler, Higgins, Zion, Hunter, Slaughter, quite the name for a cemetery, Cutler, Mansfield, and Peach Ridge Cemetery. Some say these cemeteries are actually arranged in the shape of a pentagram with Wilson Hall right at the center. Next, we have Kirtland, Ohio, which doesn't have much of a reputation of being haunted itself. What it does have, though, is a reputation for mutated creatures that are said to stalk the forests. Creatures known as melon heads. Deep within its dense forests are tales of the mysterious and eerie creatures known as the melon heads. According to local lore, the melon heads are said to be humanoid beings with these abnormally large bulbous hairless heads, resembling melons. I picture them kind of looking a bit like Hey Arnold, which would be a lot less cute in real life. Uh, these elusive creatures are rumored to lurk in the shadows of the forests, emerging only under cover of darkness to stalk unsuspecting travelers. Now, there are a few different versions of the melon head's tale, but the most well-known story or explanation for these creatures was that a mad doctor was conducting unethical experiments on a bunch of orphans. Experiments which caused their bulbous craniums to uh, take shape. At one point, the orphans got fed up with being experimented on, and they hated their melon bulbous dumb heads, and they banded together, killing the mad scientist before setting his home on fire and running off into the woods. Sightings and encounters of melon heads, though, continue to be reported to this day. Cleveland is also said to have some creepy paranormal stuff going on, mostly from the supposedly haunted Franklin Castle, which is said to be Ohio's most haunted house. The Franklin Castle is a towering structure with a dark and mysterious past. Built in the late 19th century, Franklin Castle has long been rumored to be haunted by restless spirits. Stories of tragedy, death, and mystery surround it. Legend has it that the castle's original owner, Haynes Tideman, suffered multiple personal losses within its walls, leading to rumors 
of curses and supernatural stuff going on. Pretty soon after his family moved in, Tideman's mother died, his sister then died of diabetes, and over the next three years, more and more of his siblings died prematurely. Only two of the six actually made it to adulthood, so it's really no wonder why the place is said to have some darkness lingering in it. Over the years, visitors and residents have reported strange sounds, apparitions, and unexplained phenomena within the castle. Despite renovations and changes in ownership, one thing has always stayed the same, the paranormal activity. Next up on the list is Put-In Bay. Now, Put-In Bay, Ohio may be known for its sunny shores and summer fun, but lurking beneath the surface, there's some creepy stuff going on. From what I've read, there are three major haunted hotspots. First up, we have the Park Hotel. This hotel has stood since the late 1800s, and it's seen its fair share of guests come and go. Go. also means there's a lot of history, some of it dark. Some visitors have reported more than just creaky floorboards and old-fashioned charm. Rumor has it that the Park Hotel is haunted by the ghost of a young woman who tragically fell to her death from one of the upper floors. Guests have reported strange noises, flickering lights, and even sightings of a figure wandering the halls late at night. Next, there's the Dollar House, a Victorian mansion. Legend has it that the original owner, Valentine Dollar, was involved in some shady dealings during Prohibition, including smuggling alcohol and hiding it in secret passages throughout the house, and today visitors claim to hear whispers and footsteps echoing through the empty rooms, as if the ghosts of Dollar's past are still lingering within the walls. Then there's the Crew's Nest, a historic home that sits on a cliff overlooking Lake Erie. This mansion was once owned by Jay Cook a banker and financier, but there's a tragic tale of one of Cook's daughters that's left its mark on the property. The story goes that the young girl fell to her death from one of the windows, and her ghost is said to still haunt the grounds, appearing as a fleeting figure in white. Moving on to Marietta, Ohio next, a charming town that also has its fair share of ghost stories, and most of the scary stuff happens at Hotel Lafayette. This hotel was built in the late 1800s. Over the years, guests and staff report reported strange occurrences and unexplained phenomena while staying there, leading many to believe that the hotel is haunted by spirits. One of the most famous ghostly residents of the Hotel Lafayette is said to be a woman named Sarah, who reportedly took her own life in one of the rooms, and guests have reported hearing disembodied cries, footsteps, and even seeing apparitions wandering the halls late at night. Others have claimed to feel an eerie presence or sudden drops in temperature, but Sarah isn't the only ghost rumored to haunt the Hotel Lafayette. Some guests have reported encountering the spirit of a young girl who plays tricks on unsuspecting visitors by moving objects or flickering lights. A real brat of a ghost. But at least she's still having fun in the afterlife, so props to her. Next up, we have another kind of Chernobyl-like Ohio small town, Cheshire. Only a handful of people still call this place home. At one time, this was a bustling town, but barely anyone lives there at this point, and that's because of the environmental hazards caused by a nearby power plant. The plant emitted a thick, sooty residue and chemical fogs that would blanket the town sporadically. Obviously, not at all uh, safe for residents to live in that kind of condition, so many abandoned their homes and started new lives in other places. Eventually, the power company responsible for the pollution was compelled to just buy out the entire town. But finally, we have the abandoned town of Moonville. Love that name, Moonville. This is a ghost town with only a few traces left behind. A cemetery, some foundations, and a desolate railroad tunnel. But what sets Moonville apart are the chilling tales that surround its abandoned tunnel. Stories that have been passed down for decades. One of the most famous specters haunting Moonville is that of Theodore Lawhead, the unfortunate engineer whose spirit is said to roam the tracks. Back in the 1880s, Lawhead met a tragic end when his train collided head-on with another. Now visitors report sightings of a ghostly figure with a lantern in his hand pacing along the track and disappearing into the tunnel. Then there's the story of the Brakeman, a ghost believed to be that of a young man who met his demise after a night of heavy drinking. Legend has it that he fell asleep on the tracks, never to awaken again because he was too sauced to wake up before a train ran him over. Then there's the Lavender Lady. Some say they've seen a frail elderly woman walking near the tunnel only for her to vanish into thin air, leaving behind the lingering sense of lavender. Some say she's the spirit of Mary Shea, or Shay, who met her end on those very tracks. There's also the spirit known as the Bully, believed to be the restless spirit of Baldy Keaton, 
a Moonville resident who liked a good old fist fight. The tale goes that after a scuffle at the saloon, Baldi was found dead on the tracks. As for how he died, no one knows for sure, but now his ghost is said to loom above the tunnel, glaring at unsuspecting visitors and even pelting them with stones. And we're starting off the list with the town of Holman in Wisconsin. This small village has a story about one of the wildest cryptids in the United States, the Man Bat. Unfortunately, it's not Batman. This is a large half man, half bat looking creature, far less friendly. Actually, there is a Man Bat in the actual Batman. It's a bit more like that, the villain, the scary monster guy. So this story goes, then on a September night in 2006, a father and son had a terrifying run-in with what they described as a man bat while driving down Briggs Road at night. Traveling in their truck, the pair spotted a massive figure hurtling towards them in the darkness. The father swerved to try and avoid colliding with the thing, and the creature abruptly changed course, flying up into the sky with a piercing shriek. Now immediately afterward, both men were overcome by this sudden and severe illness. For forcing them to pull over and vomit. Now some say that has something to do with the creature. I don't know, it was maybe emitting something into the air. I just think they saw something really wild and it was overwhelming. I, I'd probably be barfing after seeing something like that. A giant winged creature flying towards my car. I almost just died. They described the creature to authorities saying it was six to seven feet tall with leathery bat-like wings, clawed appendages, and glowing yellow eyes. Some speculate that this bat creature could somehow be linked to the infamous Mothman, or that it's potentially even just the same creature. Next up, we've got Saxtown, more like Axtown, a small town located just outside of Milstadt in Illinois. In 1847, the town was comprised of mostly German immigrants, and on March 19th of that same year, one of them, Fritz Stelzeride, was killed. After responding to a knock on the front door of his farmhouse, he was struck down with an axe. The killer then entered the home and killed his father, his mother, his grandfather, and his siblings, all with the same weapon. The bodies were found by Stelzeride's neighbor who got suspicious when he didn't see anyone working on the farm that day. He discovered the disheveled bodies with their throats gouged from end to end. No one knows who the killer was or what their motivation was for ending the lives of an entire family in such a gruesome way. One theory, however, is that the family had been hiding gold on the property, but this was never proved because the existence, or the absence, of the money was never proved. Another theory is that a family member did the killing so that they would become the sole heir to the inheritance, a theory backed by the fact that after the killings, the one remaining member of the family, who had not been on the farm that day, as far as we know, fled the country and changed his name. But again, if someone is targeting Stell's rides, it's probably best not to be one, so his logic uh, could come from somewhere else. Moving on to Woodland Park in Teller County, Colorado. Now, we have a very unsettling and tragic case involving a young man named Joshua Maddox. So in 2008, a man named Chuck Murphy was demolishing his old wood cabin when he came across something incredibly disturbing. It was the remains of Joshua Maddox, a young man who had been missing for seven years at that point. He'd been stuck in the chimney. Now, it's pretty obvious that he died in the chimney, but there's always been this mystery as to why he was in there in the first place. Joshua was last seen alive in May of 2008 when he left his family's home to take a walk, but he never returned. Joshua seemed to have vanished without a trace. Then, in 2015, he was found lodged in the chimney of the cabin. This was the last place anyone was expecting to find him, which is why he was found completely by accident. So now people were wondering what happened to him during those years that he was missing. Some think there may have been foul play involved, that someone had forced him into that chimney. Others think he'd just been maybe up on the roof of the cabin for whatever reason, and then had an accident. Next up, we have the mystery of the Below killings, which took place in Windsor, North Carolina in 1993, back when the town had a population of just 4,000 people. So small, yes, mysterious, also yes. On June 6, a man armed with various weapons entered the local Below grocery after hours. There were six employees in the building all doing their closing duties when the man arrived and using his handheld projectile 
weapon. He led them all into the meat cutting room in the back. He bound their hands with duct tape and then stacked the employees two by two before firing his weapons at all six. He then grabbed a meat cleaver and used it to impale the bodies numerous times again and again until the blade actually broke off into one of the victims backs. Super disgusting but surprisingly after the attack one of the victims was able to break free and call the police. Even more surprising three of the employees actually survived the attack as well. The surviving employees were able to give a description of the man to police, but neither could figure out who committed the heinous crime, why, and where they are now. But the police did say it was malicious and thought out. There's currently a $30,000 reward for any information that can lead to the arrest of the assailant, so if you know anything, give the Windsor, North Carolina police a call and leave a comment. Next on the list is the Jameson family case. In October of 2009, Bobby Jameson, his wife Sherilyn, and their daughter Madison disappeared from their home in Oklahoma. They were last seen alive on their home surveillance system footage, making trips between their vehicle and their home, packing to leave in what authorities described as this very odd, almost trance-like state. Their abandoned truck was discovered days later in Latimer County, Oklahoma, with their malnourished dog inside and important belongings like their ID cards, their wallets, phones, a GPS system, and a large stack of cash. The family had been considering purchasing a plot of land nearby at the time of their disappearance, but it wasn't until November of 2013 that the skeletal remains of two adults and their daughter were found by hunters in a remote area of Latimer County, less than three miles from where the truck was abandoned. The remains were confirmed to belong to the Jameson family. The exact cause of death couldn't be determined because of how advanced the decomposition was. So the case is still completely unsolved. Next up, we have the mystery of the vanishing Iowa town of Urkhammer. In 1928, the town was small but thriving. It was well kept and growing. The grass was always mowed, the roads were always clean, and ever so often new buildings would pop up as well. Pretty normal town, right? Well, things started to get weird when an aerial photo taken of the town painted an almost opposite picture of what could be seen from the point of view of someone on the ground. The town looked abandoned and disheveled. The grass looked overgrown and unkempt. A weird photo is weird, but many people did their best to believe that the image was the result of a messed up camera lens or something of the sort. But then things got weirder. During a road trip, an American man had stopped to fill up his gas tank in the town, but when he drove away, he realized that his tank had never been filled up, and so he drove back to get the gas that he paid for. He ran out of gas before he could reach the town, but he could see it, and it didn't look far, so he got out of his car and began walking, and walking, and walking. He never made it. No one knows what happened to the town. Some believe it chipped away bit by bit, and others claim that it vanished into thin air out of the blue one afternoon. All right, next we have the case of Jessica Chambers. This one is pretty distressing. So this happened in Cortland, Mississippi. It's still one of the most baffling cases in the state. Just after 8 p.m. on December 6th, 2014, the body of a burning woman was found next to her car, which was also on fire. It was Jessica Chambers. She was still alive and told first responders that a man named Eric, or Derek, had set her on fire. She was rushed to the hospital where she died the following morning from her burns. Now here are the events that led up to her being found. She spent the morning with friends before heading to her mother Lisa's house where she took a nap. Later in the afternoon, she received a text message and left her mother's house, mentioning that she was going to grab something to eat and clean out her car. Around 5.30 p.m., Jessica was spotted at a gas station approximately a mile and a half from where her body would later be discovered. This was the first last confirmed sighting of her alive. Location data from her phone indicated that she'd traveled to nearby Batesville around 6 p.m. She returned to Cortland around 6.30 p.m. At about 6.45, she made a call to her mother who noted that the call was unusually quiet. This was just 15 minutes before Jessica drove to the area where her body was found. At 7.30 p.m., she arrived at the location where, tragically, she lost her life about 30 minutes later. Nobody knew who this Eric or Derek could have been. Everyone, everyone with those names in the surrounding area was questioned, but they were all ruled out. The case is still a complete mystery. 
Next up we have the Gurdon Light, which can be found in Gurdon, Arkansas, or Arkansas if you're James. <laughs> He'll never live that down, guys. The light appears floating over the town's railroad tracks. It's eerie, ominous, and it glows a bright bluish white and sometimes has a bit of an orange tint. While the light might sound like some kind of ghost story or urban legend, it's actually not. It's a real phenomenon that occurs on a regular basis and that has been witnessed by hundreds of people, and maybe you if you decide to go visit. But still Still, no one knows why this light appears. There have been, of course, speculative ghost stories. Some people believe that one day, many, many years ago, a worker was killed on the train tracks and lost his head, and the light is the worker trying to find it again. Others believe he was killed by a co-worker with either a hammer or railroad spike, and some people believe in a much more scientific explanation. Kind of. Underground quartz crystals in the area that are under constant stress cause an electric reaction that results in the glow. Is that true? We don't know. There's not really a lot of scientific evidence to back the scientific theory up. Quotations, of course. The light is always there, but it's only visible at night. Some people believe it to be swamp fog, but that also doesn't make sense. Whole lot of theories for this one, but no real answers. If you have a theory, why not add it to the already very long list down below. Now we move on to Longview, Texas to discuss a mysterious entity that's said to lurk in the Gregg County Historical Museum. This eerie presence lurks on the second floor, where a century-old iron coffin holds a haunting secret. Larry Corrington, a member of the board of directors, has spent a long time volunteering at the museum and, and has experienced some uh, pretty unsettling stuff. According to him, while he works downstairs, he sometimes hears this distinct sound of small footsteps echoing near the coffin upstairs. And he's not the only one who's heard them either. Other volunteers have also reported hearing these phantom footsteps. The origins of the iron coffin date back to the 1880s when it was discovered near downtown Longview. Inside the coffin were the remarkably preserved remains of a young girl. It's believed that she passed away while on vacation and her family, unable to transport her body back home to West Texas, chose to lay her to rest in the iron coffin. Now the girl's remains were reinterred at Greenwood Cemetery, but the coffin itself found its way to the Gregg County Historical Museum in 1980, where it's been ever since. Next up, we've got the Well to Hell, located in the back of an old graveyard in Sabatis, Maine. In 1956, it is said that a local boy had been dared by his friends to descend into the well. The young men were in high spirits, making jokes as their friend began his descent into the well. Well, they lowered him down using a rope, but when he reached the bottom, his friends assumed he would call up or yank the rope to signal that he wished to be lifted back out, but there was nothing. Just silence and no sign of movement. Eventually the friends took initiative and dragged the boy back up from the well, but as he emerged from the darkness, he looked like a completely different person. His hair had gone white, his eyes appeared as though they had lost what was human about them. It was like he had aged and completely changed in a matter of minutes, and not only that, but he had gone mad. He was unable to respond when his friends asked him what happened in the well. After the incident, he was confined to a mental institution and he never spoke another word ever again, but he would occasionally scream in terror. What happened in the well that day, no one knows, no one's been able to figure it out, what goes on down there, uh, but I think a pretty good theory is that it was, in fact, a well to hell. From disasters to battle and even the story of a daring pirate, these small towns have terrifying stories, so let's dive right in. Starting off our list today, we have Nakatush. Our, I'm so sorry. I likely said that wrong and I'm sure that there will be some other town names that I mispronounce later on so just let me know kindly down in the comments how you would say them all right I'm here to learn Louisiana's oldest town Nakatush is known for its stunning historic district and beautiful Cane River but it also harbors a darker past among the most whispered about sites is the Magnolia plantation where some claim to hear the clanking of chains from the days of slavery 
scary and see ghostly figures in the fields at night. Another notable location is the haunted Bullard Mansion, where the apparition of a sorrowful woman is said to wander the rooms, mourning a tragic loss from centuries ago. Along the Cane River, locals and visitors have reported unexplained lights and shadowy figures, suggesting a lingering presence of those who once lived and died in this historic town. These tales only contribute to the town's reputation as a place where the past is never entirely at rest. Next up today we have Old Algiers. Just across the Mississippi River from the French Quarter, Old Algiers is one of the oldest parts of New Orleans and exudes a quaint yet mysterious charm. Its history of maritime disasters, battles, and yellow fever epidemics has given rise to numerous ghost stories. Legends tell of spirits from different eras wandering its locales, notably the haunted Algiers Courthouse, where visitors often report eerie sensations and fleeting shadows that defy explanation. Similarly, at Algiers Point, the oldest part of the neighborhood, phantom footsteps and ghostly apparitions are not uncommon. Some believe these hauntings are the souls of those affected by the area's tumultuous events, unable to find peace, forever imprinting their presence on old Algiers historical canvas. Next up today we have Gretna. Gretna is situated on the west bank of the Mississippi River, and it is a small town with a historic district that seems to hold secrets of the past. Among its most eerily enchanting sites is the Gretna Green Blacksmith Shop, an establishment steeped in folklore and whispered tales. Legend has it that the spirits of blacksmiths and patrons from bygone eras continue to inhabit this place. Their presence felt through disembodied clanks of metal and fleeting shadows, and it's said that these spectral figures are not just remnants of the past, but guardians of stories untold, making this shop a focal point for those intrigued by the paranormal and the town's mysterious history. Next up today we have St. Francisville. St. Francisville has definitely carved its niche in the realm of the paranormal with the infamous Myrtles Plantation, a place we have spoken about many times here on the channel, and it is often cited as one of America's most haunted homes. This grand estate is of course steeped in eerie legends and is said to be haunted by the spirits of former inhabitants who met tragic fates. Among the chilling tales are those of a young girl who appears in the windows, spectral voices that echo through the hallways at night and inexplicable cold spots that move across rooms. Visitors and staff have reported encounters with apparitions and unexplained phenomena, only adding layers of intrigue and a lot of fear to the plantation's already dark history. Next up on our list today we have Materi, a suburb of New Orleans, and this place has its share of ghost stories, especially in the older parts of the town. The cemetery there has very elaborate tombs and statues, and of of course, it is said to be haunted. The cemetery's atmosphere, particularly at dusk, lends itself to the spine-chilling tales recounted by those who visit. Some speak of seeing ghostly apparitions or spectral lights weaving through the tombs, while others report the unsettling feeling of being watched or followed. The intricate mausoleums and ornate statues, some of which commemorate prominent figures from Louisiana's history, seem to hold their own secrets, contributing to the cemetery's mysterious aura. Legends suggest that the spirits of those interred within these grand vaults are restless, perhaps disturbed by the living or clinging to their earthly ties. Such stories have cemented the cemetery's reputation as not just a final resting place, but a locale where the past and the present, the tangible and the ethereal, eerily intersect. Next up today we have Chalmette. The Chalmette Battlefield and National Cemetery. These are the hallowed grounds where the pivotal battle of New Orleans took place, and it holds a deep historical and supernatural resonance. The spectral encounters reported here are not just limited to visual apparitions, but many visitors claim to hear the distant clash of arms, the urgent drum beats, and the anguished cries of soldiers echoing through the turmoil of the 1815 battle. These auditory hauntings are 
are particularly potent on foggy mornings or late evenings, creating an atmosphere that feels kind of suspended in time. Not only this, but the cemetery, final resting place for many soldiers, is said to have its own eerie ambiance. People have reported sudden temperature drops and even the feeling of being watched, suggesting that the spirits of those who fought and fell are still tethered to this place of memory and loss, especially around the anniversary of the battle. Next up today we have Jean Lafitte. Is it Jean or Jean? Let me know. This small town named after the infamous pirate is steeped in legends and lore, with many believing that Jean Lafitte's spirit still lingers. Locals and visitors whisper about ghostly pirates wandering the marshes, sometimes seen from the corner of the eye, vanishing when approached. The lore suggests that these ghosts are protectors of hidden treasures, still guarding their loot even in death. The dense fog that often blankets the area adds a kind of visual mystique giving the town an almost ethereal quality at night. Amid this fog, mysterious lights are sometimes seen moving through the trees, described by some as the lanterns of Jean Lafitte's crew, searching for something lost, or perhaps signaling to lost souls. Next up today we have Thibodeau. With deep roots in the sugarcane industry, this town not only bears the scars of its tumultuous past, but also carries the weight of its ghostly legacies. The Thibodeau Massacre, an event of racial violence, Violence is a very dark chapter in the town's history, and it is believed to have left an indelible mark on the area, with many claiming that the unrested souls of the victims still roam the town. The air seems thick with the echoes of the past, particularly at night when the boundaries between eras blur. Visitors and residents report chilling encounters with apparitions in period clothing, inexplicable sounds, and a pervasive sense of unease in certain areas. These phantoms are most often sighted near historic sites tied to the massacre, as well as along the shadowy banks of the bayous where the water whispers of old sorrows. Such tales only contribute to Thibodeau's reputation as a place where history lives on, not just in books and memories, but palpably in the very atmosphere. Moving on down today, we have Frenier. Nestled near the mysterious waters of Lake Pontchartrain, this place carries a haunting legacy amplified by its tragic history of natural disasters and eerie local folklore. The town's past is marred by catastrophic hurricanes that have decimated the community, leading to tales of lost souls and restless spirits that linger in this devastated landscape. Only adding to its mystique, Frenier is shrouded in tales of voodoo practices and curses believed by some to be intertwined with the town's misfortunes. The desolate ghost town ambiance is palpable, with abandoned structures and overgrown vegetation reinforcing this sense of abandonment and otherworldliness. Visitors and lovers of the paranormal are drawn to Frenier's secluded setting, where the whispering winds and lapping waters seem to echo with the troubled past and spectral residents. And finally on our list today we have Mandeville. Across Lake Pontchartrain from New Orleans, Mandeville has its own tales of the paranormal. Among the most talked about ghostly legends is the tale of the Mandeville Lakefront, where apparitions are said to wander the shores, especially on foggy nights, which seems to be a bit of a theme among these Louisiana places. Some locals recount seeing figures that suddenly vanish, leaving only footprints in the sand or the sound of disembodied whispers behind them. In the heart of Mandeville, historic buildings stand, and it's within these structures that many of the town's paranormal stories find their roots. For instance, there are accounts of spectral figures seen gazing out of windows, only to disappear when approached. Others have reported unexplained sounds like footsteps or muted conversations echoing through empty rooms or hallways. These occurrences have fueled a sense of intrigue and mystery, making Mandeville a place where the past seems to intersect with the present in the most eerie of ways. Starting off our list today, we have Beachy Head, located in Eastbourne, UK, and home to the Beachy Head Cliff, aka the highest Chalksea Cliff in Britain. Standing at 162 meters, 
530 feet above sea level. The area is beautiful, but it hides an incredibly dark secret. Since 1965, at least 500 people have died at the cliffs. One notable death would have to be that of Jesse Earle, who was found in 1983 at the base of the cliffs, nine years after she disappeared. While many deaths that have occurred at Beachy Head relate to either accident or intentional self-inflicted harm, this particular death was ruled as a killing as clear signs of foul play were more than evident. Jessie's assailant remains a mystery, but her parents strongly believe that her death was orchestrated by Peter Tobin, a serial killer who had lived in the area at the time of Jesse's disappearance. Due to lack of evidence and the level of decomposition on the body and lack of DNA, police were never able to link Tobin to the crime, but considering the fact that Tobin was a diagnosed psychopath who enjoyed violating and ending the lives of young women and who claims to have taken the lives of over 48 women, I'd say there's a high possibility that he was in fact the culprit in this particular situation too. Next up on our list today we have Mullinakill in Northern Ireland. I'm sorry I probably absolutely butchered that. Northern Ireland is full of ancient legends and superstitions but the small village of Mullinakill is home to one of my personal favorite spooky tales. The Headless Horse. Not the Headless Horseman, the Headless Horse. This story starts off during the period of the Napoleonic Wars, so between 1803 and 1815. During this time, Sir William Verner, who hailed from Mullenakill and was a soldier, headed off to fight in the battle, and when he left, he brought with him his favorite horse, Constantine. Sadly, during the battle, Constantine the horse lost his head. That would be absolutely devastating to witness, and that is exactly how Sir William felt. Of course, his trusted steed deserved a proper send-off, so William brought the body back home with him to lay the horse to rest, and as they say, well, the rest is history. Hundreds of years later, locals report the sound of ghostly hooves echoing throughout the village and surrounding area at night, said to be the ghost of Constantine still riding through the village. Next up, we have the underside of Buckinghamshire, England, or more like underground, I guess. You see, in Buckinghamshire, if you look hard enough, you will find an old, unassuming church accompanied by a mausoleum, surrounded by fields of lush green grass. But if you look even harder, you will find that beneath that church lies a series of underground tunnels and chambers that once belonged to the Hellfire Club. No, not the group from Stranger Things, but a secret society created by the Duke of Wharton in 1718. By the 1750s, however, there was a new main man in town by the name of Sir Francis Dashwood, and he founded his very own Hellfire Club and built the tunnels as a secret meeting place for its members. So what went on below the earth of the countryside? No one exactly knows. It's a secret club, obviously, and all the records of the club were actually burned when the secretary died. But it is believed, and it has been speculated, that the tunnels were used for various debaucherous activities such as SEX parties, pagan rituals, satanic worship, and even human sacrifice. If you go down there, let me know uh, if it's haunted, if you find any sigils, just let me know in the comments if you've been. Next on our list today, we have Stirling, Scotland. Stirling is a beautiful market town located in central Scotland that is surrounded by incredible farmland. And while it is filled with amazing tales from history, it is also full of creepy tales of ghostly hauntings as well. You cannot visit Stirling without seeing the incredible Stirling Castle, which sits right on top of a hill. And it is here that we start our ghostly tour. The castle is said to be the home of many ghosts, the most famous of which is likely the Green Lady, who is said to have lost her life while saving Mary Queen of Scots from a fire. Others say that Queen Mary herself haunts the castle and can be seen wandering the grounds while wearing a pink dress. So weird how like women ghosts, they're always like, it's the white lady, it's the green lady, it's the pink lady. I don't know why, it's just weird. Anyways, that was just me noticing that. Aside from the castle, there are more haunting tales that come from a more likely place, the Darnley Coffee House on Bow Street. This place is said to be haunted by quite a mischievous ghost, which sounds like 
I don't know, a bit of a nightmare, especially if you're trying to run a small business. There's also a ghost that is said to still linger at the Old Town Jail, and he is said to be the earthbound spirit of the last man executed for his crimes at the site. It's safe to say that Sterling is full of beautiful places, creepy tales, and a ton of fascinating history. Next on our list, we have Pendle Village, located in Lancashire. Way back in the 1700s, under the rule of King James Britain, was particularly opposed to the idea of witches, witchcraft, and women with an education. Anyways, the small village of Pendle gained notoriety as a hotspot for witches in 1612 after a young woman named Alison, not Alison, that's Alison with a Z, device, had placed a curse on a traveling salesman. Alison had been begging on the side of the road when the salesman passed by. She asked him for some pins for whatever reason, but he refused. And so she cursed him, and he immediately became paralyzed and fell onto the ground. Okay, so I know usually these stories are like, she can do math, burn her, she's a witch, but like, this kind of sounds pretty legit. Anyways, she was arrested, along with nine others accused of practicing witchcraft. In August, all ten of them were taken to the gallows, and among them were Alison, a woman named Alice Nutter, five other young women, two men, and one elderly woman in her 80s. Coming up next, we have St. Osith, which is located in Essex. This small Essex village has quite a disturbing history, beginning with the story of Princess Osith herself. Princess Osith was the daughter of a Mercian king and was said to have been raised in a nunnery. She later became an abbess and founded a convent in what is now St. Osith, Essex. According to legend, Osith was martyred by Danish invaders who took her head. I guess that's a theme with me today, which is kind of a little unsettling. This legend states that after this event, she picked up her head and walked to the door of the nunnery, where she finally collapsed and died. Pretty badass, and that is exactly what led to the creepy tales of today. It is said that the ghost of Princess Osith wanders the grounds of St. Osith Priory, the site where her convent once stood. Her apparition is typically described as carrying her head under her arm, reliving the moment of her martyr dumb in perpetual haunting. There is also a holy well in St. Osith said to have sprung up where she fell after her execution. The well became a pilgrimage site and it's believed to have healing properties. Some local lore suggests that the area around the well is also haunted by Osith's spirit who continues to guard the waters. This is only the beginning somehow of the horrifying tales though, as later in the 16th and 17th centuries, this place was the site of witch trials, where many women were convicted and executed on the grounds of being accused of being witches. You know, could do like four plus four and suddenly you're a witch. One final thing I'll say about St. Osith is that this site is also said to contain Britain's most haunted home known as The Cage. This house has seen many owners over the years, none of which have stayed long before being driven out of the house by a very violent presence. They should put that thing on Airbnb and just See what happens. I'd stay there. Why not? One night? What are you gonna do, ghosty? Next up, we have Wickington, Staffordshire. Honestly, the names of these towns are pure gold. What goes on in them? Not so much. This particular town is home to a particularly gruesome killing that took place in June 1972. One evening, a young woman by the name of Judith Roberts decided to go for a bike ride. She said goodbye to her mother, headed out the front door, hopped on her little green bicycle, and made her way down a quiet country lane. She was never seen alive again. Sometime after she set out on her bike ride, she was snatched and killed by blunt force. Her body was hidden in a field. There was a soldier living in the town at the time of Judith's death, Andrew Evans, who had been obsessed with the young woman. In fact, he even admitted to having vivid dreams about ending her life. And after she died, Evans went to the police station to request photos of the crime scene, and he ended up confessing to being the killer, but he later withdrew his statement and accused the police of using a sedative on him in order to obtain a false confession. His conviction was overturned and he received almost one million pounds in compensation. For those who are not British, pounds are money. Judith's death was never solved, but some people believe she was killed by Peter Sutcliffe, aka the Yorkshire Ripper, who in 1981 received 20 life sentences for ending the lives of at least 13 separate women 
in the area, so not a far stretch. Next up on our list today, we have Pluckley in Kent. The village of Pluckley, which I just said, located in the county of Kent in England, is known for being one of the most haunted villages in the entire country. There are numerous ghost stories associated with the village, many of which have been passed down through generations. One of the most famous tales is that of the Screaming Woods, a dense forest area on the outskirts of the village. According to legend, the woods are haunted by the ghost of a highwayman who was caught and killed by villagers, and his screams can still be heard at night. That's absolutely chilling. Another famous ghost story involves the watercress woman. We had the green lady, the pink one, we got the watercress woman now. A ghostly figure who is said to appear near a stream in the village carrying a basket of watercress on her arm. It is believed that she lost her life in the stream while picking watercress and her ghost has been seen by many villagers over the years. Other reported sightings include ghosts of a monk, a schoolmaster, and even a haunted pub. Despite the spooky tales, Pluckley remains a charming and picturesque village, attracting visitors from all over the world. So, uh, visit if you dare, all right? A ghost and a pint. Next up, Fairnew Fellum in Hertfordshire. On January 7th of 2004, Robert Workman, an 83-year-old lieutenant, was killed at point-blank range, you know what that means, standing in the doorway of his home. Robert was killed by Christopher who had been hired to remove a wasp's nest from the retired lieutenant's home. But it wasn't until after Christopher was arrested for an unrelated killing that his crimes against Robert were revealed. Four years after, in 2006, Christopher was arrested for killing a man named Fred. Fred was backpacking across Europe when he was lured into a field and killed, also at point blank range, also by Christopher, who then cut up Fred's body, placed it in trash bags, and set it on fire. While serving time for this crime, Christopher had revealed to a cellmate that he had been the one to kill Robert back in 2004. Not only that, but he had entered into a sexual relationship with Robert before doing so, and the reason he did it was because he was offered compensation for his hand in the elderly man's death. Talk about no loyalty amongst killers. He's not really a thief, so talk about it. Finally on our list today we have Glencoe Argyll. Glencoe is a beautiful and rugged valley located in the Argyll region of Scotland and is pretty famous for being one of the settings in the Bond film Skyfall, but it's also famous for its haunting tale. The area is steeped in history and it all starts back in 1692 with what is known as the Massacre of Glencoe. In that year, soldiers loyal to the English crown killed members of the Macdonald clan who had been hosting them as guests. It's giving Game of Thrones. It is said that the ghosts of the lost McDonald's still haunt the valley, seeking revenge on their killers. Fair enough. Another famous tale is that of the Grey Man. Here we are again. Oh my god. According to legend, the Grey Man is a ghostly figure who is said to haunt the summits of the mountains in Glencoe. His ghostly presence has been reported by many climbers and hikers over the years. We're going to kick things off with Loveland. How on earth did I not put Loveland, Ohio in part one? Loveland is home to one of the strangest creatures said to stalk the state, the Loveland Frog. But it's also home to a supposedly haunted castle. Loveland Castle was constructed by Harry Andrews. A uh, very interesting man this guy was. He had a lot of interest in knights and medieval lore. Andrews was born in 1890. He worked as a medic during World War I. He then contracted meningitis during the war and was believed to be dead. His body was actually moved to the morgue, like he was done. But when his body was taken back to the hospital to be dissected, the doctors were like, hey, you know what, why not? Let's just see if we can get his heart beating again with adrenaline. Miraculously, it worked. Andrews, who'd now spent a whole bunch of time in Europe and then almost died, was now even more into medieval history and returned home with this newfound determination to build his very own castle. Eventually, he constructed Loveland Castle along the banks of the Little Miami River. Andrews then moved into the castle, where he lived until he died in 1981. Today, the castle is the headquarters for the Knights of the Golden Trail, an organization Andrews started 
dedicated to upholding the principles of knighthood, but Harry Andrews' spirit is said to still roam the castle grounds. Objects will mysteriously disappear or move, and voices are heard echoing through the corridors. And as I said at the top, of course, Loveland's supernatural reputation doesn't end with this castle. One of the most Famous legends is that of the Loveland Frog, or frogs. There have been multiple large frog-like creatures spotted near the Little Miami River over the years. Next up, we have Ashtabula, which is said to be haunted by the spirits of a tragic train disaster. So on December 29th, 1876, the Pacific Express No. 5 crossed the Ashtabula Bridge. But because of particularly cold weather and structural weaknesses, the bridge collapsed, sending the train plummeting into the icy river below, and in the end, 98 people died. The scene must have been absolutely horrific, with rail cars crashing into each other and igniting in flame, and firefighters were unable to put out the flames, so people just cried out in pain and horror as they were consumed by fire, trapped in the wreckage. It was one of the worst rail accidents in US history, and the screams of those victims victims still haunt the area to this day. Some say you can occasionally hear them above the rush of the river. The Chestnut Grove Cemetery holds the remains of 19 of these victims, but their spirits are said to be very much active. Visitors to the cemetery have reported seeing ghostly apparitions. But along with the victims of the tragedy, there's also said to be the ghost of Charles Collins, one of the developers of the bridge. Witnesses claim to have seen his guilty spirit weeping at the sight of the tragedy or crying over people's graves. Some claim to see tiny lights even hovering below the new bridge where the old one once stood. Rogue's Hollow near Doylestown, Ohio has its fair share of spooky tales as well. It's said that a mill worker died in a pretty gruesome manner, getting crushed by the mill wheel, and now his spirit is said to guard the area, keeping outsiders at bay. Then there's the eerie tale of the headless horse and the ghost oak tree. So at one time there was a large oak tree near Route 65, and one of its branches hung so low that riders on horseback had to duck as they passed under it. Well, one story goes that the branch was weighed down extra low with ice, and a poor horse just ran into it at top speed, lobbing off its head. From that point on, riders passing the area late at night would occasionally come across a devilish figure riding a ghostly, headless horse. Next up, we have Oxford, Ohio, which has one of the coolest ghosts, a phantom motorcyclist. So the story goes that back in the 40s, there was this farmer's daughter. She was head over heels for this guy who was a bit of a James Dean type, leather jacket, motorcycle, very rebellious, also a lot like me, minus the motorcycle, the leather jacket, and the rebellious part. His name was James, that's the similarity. And her father was not too thrilled about their relationship. He thought the guy was trouble, and he probably wasn't wrong. He forbade his daughter from seeing him. So to avoid her father's disapproval, they met up in complete secret, usually late at night when the coast was clear. And when it was, the girlfriend would flash the porch light three times as a signal for him to come over. Well, one night, the boyfriend decided he wanted to take their relationship to the next level and propose. He saw the three flashes and revved up his motorcycle, racing towards her house to pop the question. But as soon as he sped down the road, he lost control of his bike, crashing into a barbed wire fence. And ever since, people claim they've seen this mysterious light flickering in the distance along the road where he crashed, said to be the spirit of the phantom motorcyclist, still trying to reach his girl's house to ask for her hand in marriage. Next on the list is Chillicothe, where there were a series of mysterious disappearances between 2014 and 2015. Now, it all began in the spring of 2014 when Charlotte Trago vanished without a trace. Trago uh, who had struggled with addiction, was a mother of two, and she remains missing to this day. Shortly after Trago's disappearance, another woman, Tamika Lynch, who was a friend of Trago's, went missing as well. Her body was discovered three weeks later by kayakers. It's pretty obvious there was foul play, 
but the official cause of her death was deemed inconclusive. Then there was the disappearance of Wanda Lemons in November of 2014. She's also never been found. On Christmas Day 2014, Shasta Hemelrick went missing. Her body was later recovered from the Scioto River. Authorities claim she took her own life, but her family, as well as many others, think someone took it from her. Then there was the disappearance and discovery of Tiffany Sayer's body in May 2015. Her remains were found in a creek covered by a sheet. And the final victim, Timberly Claytora's body, was found near an abandoned building. She died at the hands of a firearm. And the case just would have been handled completely differently if these women hadn't been battling addiction. That was the one thing connecting all these. They were all involved in that world. And there's just this kind of lax attitude when it comes to situations like this, unfortunately, where authorities are like, well, you know, they're part of that world. This is just what happens. So it really hasn't got the attention that it deserves. Now we move on to the town of Lancaster. Here, there used to be a home with an incredibly dark past, the Mudhouse Mansion. So the mansion's origins go back to the mid 19th century when it was built as a grand estate for a wealthy family. But as time went on, the home fell into disrepair and eventually it was abandoned and left to decay. And over the years, all these urban legends started to form around it. One of the most infamous stories is that the family had actually died in the mansion. Some versions of the tale claim that they were killed by an unknown assailant. Others go that they'd been driven to madness by some sinister force lurking within the mansion's walls. The Mudhouse Mansion was even said to be the birthplace of Bloody Mary herself. The mansion was demolished in 2015, but some folks will still claim to see ghostly figures of the mansion's former residents wandering the grounds, forever trapped in a limbo between the worlds of the living and the dead. All right, one of the strangest unsolved mysteries in Ohio has to be the Circleville Letters case. Now I'm gonna paraphrase here because there's a lot of detail. We could probably do an entire video about this case alone. But I'll go over it. It all started in 1976. Residents of Circleville started receiving these unsettling, threatening letters containing all these intimate details of their personal lives. The letters were postmarked from Columbus, Ohio, but there was no return address. One of the receivers of these letters was Mary Gillespie, a bus driver. She was accused in one of these letters of having an affair with the school superintendent and the letters just kept coming in from this unknown sender. Then Mary's husband, Ron, also became a target. He received a chilling ultimatum to end his wife's supposed affair or face dire consequences, death. Ron was found dead in his pickup truck after a mysterious phone call, which had seemingly confirmed his suspicion about the letter writer's identity. He'd left in his pickup truck with a firearm, but was found dead soon after having crashed into a tree. Now authorities ruled Ron's death an accident, but then the letters continued. A number of residents received letters saying that Sheriff Dwight Radcliffe, who had investigated Ron's death, had been involved in a cover-up. At one point, this mysterious writer even planted threatening signs along Mary Gillespie's bus route, one of which she went to take down, only to find out it'd been booby-trapped. If Mary had pulled the sign down in a particular way, a small pistol would have fired at her. Now, one man was arrested, Paul Freshor, but it's never been 100% verified that he was behind these letters. Eventually, he got out on parole. Case is still a mystery to this day. In the Hills and Dales Metro Park in Kittering, Ohio, there's a structure with a very shadowy past, the Haunted Witch's Tower, also known as Frankenstein's Castle. It was completed in 1941, and this 30-foot tall tower was constructed by boys with the National Youth Administration using salvaged stone. Its purpose was to provide panoramic views of the community country club, with its lookout platform offering vistas stretching up to 15 miles. But because of how remote the tower is, 
A lot of young hooligans started flocking there in the 60s. Graffiti covered its walls, and bottles of liquor and beer cans littered the grounds. Even shingles torn from the roof and glass bottles became ammo for attacks on passing cars below on Pearson Boulevard. Then in 1967, during a thunderstorm, a young woman named Peggy Harmison sought shelter inside the tower with her boyfriend, Ronnie Stevens. Bad move. Lightning struck the tower, killing Peggy instantly. Her body was found on the 11th step, half covered in severe burns. Ronnie survived, but he was found in a state of uncontrollable shock, apparently running around screaming. And ever since that night, there have been stories about the ghost of Peggy haunting the tower. All right, let's switch things up with a haunted golf club. You don't hear about haunted golf clubs very often. Legend has it that in the 60s, a bride fell from a balcony at Oakhurst Golf Club in Grove City, Ohio, and her ghost is said to haunt the establishment to this very day. One of the most frequently reported sightings involves the ghostly figure of a woman dressed in white, believed to be the ghost of the bride. The upstairs kitchen, located near the ballroom where events are held, is said to be a hotspot for paranormal activity. Employees have reported hearing unexplained sounds of pots and pans clanging and knocking late at night, only to discover that items have been mysteriously rearranged by morning. All right, we're finishing things off today with, with Minerva. It all began in August of 1978 when the Caton family reported encountering a strange creature near their home. According to the Catons, they were enjoying a quiet evening when they heard unusual noises coming from outside. They came face to face with this towering ape-like creature standing over seven feet tall. The creature reportedly had shaggy dark fur covering its body, it had glowing red eyes, and emitted this foul odor. The Catons quickly ran back to the safety of their home and phoned the cops. In the days that followed, all these other sightings of a mysterious creature were reported by other residents of Minerva. Witnesses described similar encounters with a large, hairy beast lurking in the shadows, but none of the stories were scarier than the Catons, who said the creature returned to their property several times, hurling rocks at their home, staring at them through their kitchen window, and even killing their dog. It's uh, one of the most violent Bigfoot cases ever reported. Elmendorf, Texas was the home of Joe Ball, who committed a series of gruesome crimes in the 30s. So this is an absolutely insane case here. I'm sure viewers from Texas are very familiar with Joe Ball, but I'd never heard of this story, and I'm pretty surprised that it's not more well known. So Joe Ball was a serial killer. He has a couple interesting nicknames, the Butcher of Elmendorf and the Alligator Man both of which fit. He fought in World War I, and when he returned to Texas, he started making money as a bootlegger. Then when Prohibition ended, he opened a saloon. At the back, he built a pond where he kept six alligators. He'd often feed live cats and dogs to the gators, but that didn't satisfy him for long. Soon, women in the area started going missing, including his own wife. Now in 1938, two county sheriffs arrived at his property to question him about several of these missing women, and Ball pulled out a pistol and took his own life. But a handyman of Joe's, Clifford Wheeler, told authorities about how he'd assisted Ball in disposing of the bodies of two women who he'd killed, feeding them to his alligators. It's believed Joe Ball may have taken the lives of at least 20 women. Next up, we have a small town in Texas that was once home to a lesser known but incredibly gruesome serial killer, Henry Lee Lucas, who claims to have killed over 3,000 individuals during his criminal career, which spanned from the 1960s all the way into the 1980s. Also known as the Confession Killer or Highway Stalker, Lee Lucas was born in Blacksford, Virginia, and at a young age lost his father to hypothermia, and so his mother was forced to raise him on her own. Clearly, Henry wasn't happy with this as his mother was the first person he killed in 1960 in Michigan. He was sent to prison but only served 10 years due to overcrowding. And that's when he moved to Ringgold, Texas with his niece Frida Powell to work for a sick woman named Katie Rich, both of whom he would later kill. While he claimed to have ended the lives of thousands of individuals through restricting airways, impaling them with sharp objects, blunt force, and hit and runs, he was convicted of only 11 killings. Texarkana is home to one of the creepiest cases in the state's history, the Texarkana Moonlight 
killer case. So this case was heavy inspiration for slasher movies that would come years later, along with tons of urban legends. The killer literally wore a sack with holes cut out for his eyes and would attack innocent couples while their cars were parked in an area called Lover's Lane. It's about as classic as it gets. So the first attack happened on February 22nd, 1946. A young couple, Jimmy Hollisand and his girlfriend Mary Jean Larry, were attacked by a man with a pillowcase over his head carrying a firearm. Jimmy was pistol whipped and very injured and Mary was attacked, but the two lived. Many of the other victims wouldn't be so lucky though. He would attack six other people and it all happened in a period of 10 weeks. The assailant became known as the Phantom of Texarkana and the case was never solved. Regular hospitals are bad enough, but abandoned and haunted hospitals definitely take the cake, so of course we had to include at least one on today's list. The Yorktown Memorial Hospital located in Yorktown, Texas, between San Antonio and the Gulf Coast. It was built in 1951 to house and treat those suffering from substance abuse. When the hospital was abandoned in 1980, the living residents and staff members exited the building. But what about those who died during their time in the hospital? Well, it's said that they still inhabit the premises to this day. And no, I'm not talking about one or two patients who died while under the hospital's care, I'm talking about thousands, over 2,000 to be exact. So really it's no wonder the place is extremely haunted. Honestly, I'm surprised it didn't open up some kind of gateway to hell and land a spot on the list in our last video. Check it out if you'd like. Those who have entered the building have reported feeling a strange, rotting sensation and claim that they can feel the tormented soul's energies in the walls. Not only that, but many people have said they've heard screams and disembodied voices while inside, as well as seeing strange floating lights in the hallways, despite the fact that the building is ancient and has no electricity. If you've been, let me know your experience. Now we move on to Kerrville, Texas with the case of Janine Jones, a nurse who also terrorized San Antonio. What an absolute creep this woman is. Yes, she is still alive. She took the lives of an estimated 60 young patients in her care between 1970 and 1982. She'd inject patients with a variety of substances that would cause cardiac arrest. She first started working as a licensed vocational nurse at Bexar County Hospital in San Antonio in the pediatric intensive care unit. But hospital staff started realizing that an abnormal amount of young patients were dying in Jones's care. Now here's where things get really infuriating. An investigation could have been carried out right there and then and things could have ended here. But the hospital didn't want any negative attention and they certainly did not want to be sued. So instead of alerting authorities, they asked all of their current LVNs to resign and then rehired exclusively registered nurses to take control of the pediatric ICU. This meant that Jones could just move on and start working at another hospital, which she did. So more young patients died at her hands at a pediatric pediatrician's clinic in Kerrville. There, a doctor finally found she'd been accessing lethal amounts of succimethonium chloride. So in 1985, she was finally convicted and is now serving life in prison. Circling right on back to Yorktown, it appears as though this particular town is home to not only an incredibly haunted hospital, but also an incredibly disturbing creature known as a Wendigo. Although the creature is best described in Algonquin folklore, which is Canadian for my Americans on this channel, many locals of the town claim to have seen one of the beasts. Many people have compared the Wendigo to a skinwalker as it is tall and lanky and somewhat humanoid but can shapeshift and has been known to devour human flesh. And when a Wendigo finds the body of a deceased hiker, it will often inhabit it and then turn to killing those who attempt to come into contact with its human exterior. Many people also claim to have seen the demon take the form of animals and follow and stalk them throughout the area. Stay safe out there in Wendigo. Speaking of creepy creatures, Texas is also home to an entity known as Goatman, who stalks the old Alton Bridge connecting Denton and Copper Canyon. So the tale traces back to a black goat farmer named Oscar Washburn, who'd moved his family near the bridge. And Washburn earned a reputation as a very reliable businessman and was nicknamed the Goatman by locals. He even hung a sign on Alton Bridge pointing towards his home, proudly declaring this way to the Goatman. But in 1938, members of the local government 
Kent, who had ties to the Ku Klux Klan, kidnapped Washburn from his family. They took him to the bridge, hung a noose around his neck, and threw him over the side. When they looked down, expecting to see him dead though, they found the noose completely empty. Now, locals warn that crossing the bridge at night without headlights, just as the Klansmen did, will summon the Goat Man. People crossing the bridge will claim to spot ghostly figures, mysterious lights coming from the woods, and even physical encounters like being touched, grabbed, or having rocks thrown at them from some unseen force. Or of course, a half man, half goat monster. Next up, surprise, surprise, it's another creepy hospital, Worley Hospital in Pampa, Texas. The institution was opened in 1928, but closed its doors in the 1970s due to lack of revenue. After 40 years of sitting abandoned, the building has become quite a talking point for the town's locals, who claim that it is haunted by patients who died within its walls during its 42 years of operation. After many townspeople reported seeing a black silhouette in the window of the abandoned building, ghost hunters began to take interest. Those who have entered have been greeted with decrepit and decaying walls, ceilings, and floors that have been heavily vandalized. But it appears as though trespassers aren't the only ones to make their way through the empty halls of the once surgically specialized facility. Many of the patients who died within the building's walls, as well as a 25 year old nurse who was poisoned while working at the hospital, are said to roam the grounds. People have reported seeing demonic creatures stalking them while exploring the floors of the hospitals, with the majority of the activity taking place on the third floor where surgeries would have been performed when the hospital was running. Oh, and the current owner of the grounds wants to renovate the building into a ministry. Coincidence? I do not think so. League City, Texas is home to an area known as the Killing Fields. So there is an abnormally large list of people who have been found dead in this stretch of land surrounding Interstate Highway 45. And there are also a number of people who have gone missing from this area and have still yet to be found. And out of more than 30 cases, only a small handful have ever been solved. The place is such a hot spot for mysterious deaths that a task force, Operation Halt, was set up just to investigate these incidents alone. The first cases started cropping up in the 70s with the discovery of multiple bodies scattered throughout the area. And over the decades, law enforcement agencies have recovered the remains of numerous people, many of them young women. And it's not even clear if there's just one assailant response a group, or if the area is just an ideal spot to kind of get rid of evidence. We really don't know. It's a complete mystery to this day. And finally, we have a man with a thing for eyes. Stealing them, that is. It all started in the 1990s in a rural area of Dallas. Is it a town? Not really, but this case is pure evil, so listen up. During the 90s, SEX workers began turning up dead at an alarming rate. With one very striking thing in common, you guessed it, their eyes had been completely removed from their sockets. The killer was Charles Albright, also known as the eyeball killer. When he was young, Charles had quite the knack for taxidermy. He would stuff many animals a week, doing his best to make them look pristine, but there was one thing missing, eyes. His mother refused to buy glass eyes for the animals, and so instead, Charles would use buttons. When he got a little older, he slept with an SEX worker, which led to him getting a transmitted infection. I feel like the pieces are starting to come together. His obsession with the eyes and his hatred for women of this certain profession grew exponentially over the years, and on December 13th of 1990, he took his first life after violating the woman and he fired a projectile from a handheld weapon, execution style, into the back of her head and carefully removed the eyes of the victim with what has been described as surgical precision. Charles was convicted of one killing, but most likely committed at least three. He was sentenced to death and was executed in August of 2022. Shepherdstown, West Virginia, is arguably one of the most haunted places in America, according to those who have visited the town and experienced its dark paranormal atmosphere. Atmosphere. The town was actually formed long before America became a country. Well, 46 years at least. And it was originally named Mecklenburg, but that changed when Thomas Shepard obtained the land in 1734. It's considered a historic Civil War area as just three miles up from the town, the Antietam Battle, the most gruesome battle of the Civil War, was fought. A hotel in the town is also home to some pretty dark deaths. In one instance, a man took his own life after losing a card game. In another, a young man was killed 
for winning. Both men are said to roam around the hotel and many claim to hear the younger of the two crying out for his mother as he did during his last living moments. But perhaps the most famous sighting in the town is that of a dark shadowy figure that lurks in the clock tower after dark. Oh, and the bakery is also haunted, with almost anyone who enters it claiming to have felt the sensation of hands pushing up against them and hearing whispered conversations in the waiting area despite being completely alone. Next on the list we have Dingus in Mingo County. Love that name, Dingus. This is a very small and remote community. There are under 2,000 residents and one of the things that makes this place really interesting is that one of the only ways to access the town is through a mile long, very narrow, one lane tunnel, which can be aggravating at the best of times, I imagine, and very dangerous at the worst. But Dingus also has a pretty dark history. It was a railroad and mining town at one time, and it was one of the most lawless places in the state. Lawmen struggled to keep order, and shootouts between police and outlaws was pretty common. And one thing the residents did not take kindly to were outsiders, and a lot of this was racially motivated. It wasn't uncommon for immigrants to be met with armed townspeople at the other end of the tunnel who would use very aggressive methods to keep them away. A lot of dark things happened at Dingus Tunnel, not just from violence like this, but accidents as well, like train collisions. So aside from all the dark history, it probably comes as no surprise that many locals claim the tunnel to be quite Haunted. Next up we have the Weston Asylum. You know we had to have at least one asylum on our list. It's classic. Back in the mid 1800s, the town of Weston was home to the controversially named trans Eleni Lunatic Asylum. It was used to house and treat the mentally ill of the time. However, that pretty much meant anyone whose opinion opposed those in positions of authority or women who sometimes cried. But I digress. While the exact number of deaths that occurred on the grounds remains unknown, local historians and state hospital expert Titus Swan has estimated the number to be in or above a five-figure range, meaning that at least 10,000 people died in the hospital. So like, no wonder this place is super haunted. I mean, I think we know what kind of torment went on in those places back in the day. Not only that, but this particular asylum was often overcrowded, meaning that even without what would today be considered gross misconduct, the living conditions were already pretty bleak. Today, those those who enter the once abandoned building that has since been reopened to the public as a historic landmark have reported feeling a sense of extreme dread, seeing mysterious shadowy figures roaming the halls, and hearing the disembodied helpless screams of patients past. Next up we have Sheep Squatch of Boone County. I'm kind of cheating here with this one, adding a whole county to the list. Uh, but the creature has been spotted all throughout the place, so I kind of had to. The Sheep Squatch also sometimes referred to as the white thing, is described as a large, woolly, furred monster with goat horns and razor sharp teeth. Sightings of the creature started being reported in Boone throughout the 90s, beginning in 94, when two youngsters spotted the strange creature while playing in their yard. Now, what I find interesting about these reports is that the creature is always described as having white fur. Now, why do I find this interesting? Well, with Bigfoot sightings, there's usually a chance people could be misidentifying a bear. Whereas here, like what animal is there the size of a bear with white fur? Polar bears, but they're not really roaming around West Virginia. The creature was spotted again in 1995 by a couple driving down a road in Boone County. They spotted a large white furred animal sitting in a ditch. They didn't know what it was, so they stopped to look. Then it raced towards them. They sped out of there, but found large scratch marks on their car once they made it back home. If you're gonna do an asylum, you might as well do a prison, specifically the West Virginia Penitentiary located in the small town of Moundsville. The prison opened its doors in 1863 after West Virginia split from just Virginia, becoming its own state. During its 119 year operation, some pretty dark stuff went on inside of its walls, which earned the prison a spot on the United States Department of Justice's top 10 most violent correctional facilities list. The 
recreational area of the prison, located in the basement, often saw various forms of illegal activity, including assault, violation assault, substance abuse, and even killings. At any given time during the penitentiary's operation, between six and 700 inmates were held on the grounds. But even still, the prison was highly overcrowded, with inmates often having to sleep on the floor. And over the years, the property saw almost 1,000 deaths. Many people believe that those who died within the prison never actually left. In fact, many visitors to the grounds have seen and even photographed the shadowy figure of a man that roams the halls. And the staff working on the premises of what is now a historical site have reported being accosted while on the job. Oh, and remember the basement? Many people have claimed to have heard screams coming from its depths, but most are far too scared to go down and check it out. In the town of Princeton sits the Lake Shawnee Amusement Park. Unless you live in Princeton, West Virginia, or are a paranormal enthusiast though, you've probably never heard of the place. It's not much of a tourist destination anymore because it's been abandoned since 1988. It's said that the park was built on cursed land. And that's not just because people have seen specters lingering around the park, it's because there were tragic deaths at the park and the place was built on land with some pretty dark history. There was a massacre on this land back in 1785. The landowner, Mitchell Clay, had lost two of his sons to a Native American raiding party and sought revenge. He gathered up a bunch of locals and attacked them right back. Then, in 1926, a man named Conley Trigg Snydow Sr. decided the land would be a perfect spot for a theme park. Over the years, there were two drownings in the pool. The park was also closed for a time after a failed health inspection. Then a former employee of the park bought the land in 1988, but was forced to close it down again just a year later because of increased insurance rates. So not the best luck for this place. And now the old structures like the Ferris wheel and swing ride stand eerily unused, coated in rust and haunted by ghosts, so they say. This next one is pretty sad, but also pretty remarkable. In 1897 in Greenbrier County, and I can do a county because James did a county, so if we go down, we go down together. Anyways, in 1897 in Greenbrier County, Zona Shu was found dead. A funeral was held and Zona was laid to rest, but she couldn't rest, and so Zona's spirit visited her mother and explained to her that she had not died in the way everyone assumed she had, but instead she had been killed by her husband, who had been routinely aggressive throughout their entire marriage. Upon learning this information, Zona's mother demanded that her daughter's body be dug up and re-examined. And sure enough, upon closer inspection, it became clear to the prosecutor that Zona's neck had been broken. Her husband was arrested for the crime, and the city even installed a plaque recognizing Zona's ghost's involvement in the conviction of her killer. The town of Harper's Ferry is said to be teeming with paranormal activity. In fact, it's said to be the most haunted town in the state. Harper's Ferry played a big role in the Civil War, and a lot of both Union and Confederate soldiers died here. In September of 1862, an estimated 13,000 soldiers died at the Battle of Harper's Ferry. There were also a number of raids, one of which was led by John Brown, who's said to haunt the town to this day. Some also say that on some nights you can hear the ghostly sounds of drummers marching their way down High Street. And there's also the tale of screaming Jenny. So Jenny had no family, no home. She lived in an abandoned storage shed by the Harper's Ferry Railroad. One fall night, Jenny sat huddled by a fire, and then a spark leapt up from the fire landing on her clothes, which began to catch fire. She was too cold and weak to notice before it was too late. She started screaming and rushed down the train tracks for help. Now, here's the thing, when you're on fire, uh, your, your vision is kind of blocked by light already, so she did not see the two glowing lights of a train rushing right towards her, and she was flattened by the train. Ever since this incident, on particularly cold autumn nights, some say they can hear the sounds of screams coming from the train tracks. Conductors have even seen a glowing figure flailing in the night, only to vanish into thin air once the train 
gets up too close. Next up we have the Parkersburg North Bend Rail Trail. I'm not sure if that's a tongue twister or the title of an adult movie. But anyways, in the daytime the trail is quite lovely and pretty serene. A great place to go for picnics and lunch dates, however I suppose if your lunch date is at a park it's already a picnic. Anyways, you could also go for breakfast, but I wouldn't recommend you go at night. Why? Because it's haunted. Well. Part of it is at least. Specifically the 1,300 foot long tunnel that can be found along the trail, aka tunnel number 19. It is said that a woman wearing a white dress walks mournfully around inside of its dark walls. The legend goes that she was a bride, riding on a train with her groom when she was pushed off and died beside the tracks. People in the area have also reported having found human bones in abandoned houses nearby, but that's an entirely different mystery. For another day. And finally, we have the town of Grafton, which is famous for one of the strangest cryptids in the United States, the Grafton Monster, which was first spotted in 1964 by a reporter named Robert Cockrell. He described the creature as this large, seven to nine foot tall beast with white skin and no visible head. He was driving home from work late at night when he spotted the creature in the middle of the road. They raced home, then gathered two of his friends to come back to the site to investigate. The creature was gone, but they claimed to have come across large footprints, and they also heard a strange, low, bellowing whistle sound in the distance. The next day, dozens of calls started coming into the local newspaper, with people reporting to have spotted a similar looking creature, and that's when Cockrell decided to write his article. Reports that the cryptid started dying out by the end of that summer in 1964, but there's still sporadic sightings here and there. Starting off, we are heading over to Canyon Lake. Canyon Lake Lake was just a tranquil, gated community in California until it became the very dark backdrop for the heinous crimes of Dana Sue Gray. In a horrifying spree, Gray brutally attacked and took the lives of elderly women using their credit cards to fund lavish shopping trips. Her brutal acts, fueled by material greed, culminated in her arrest following a detailed description from a surviving victim. Gray's chilling case underscores a disturbing reality. Even the most serene towns can harbor sinister secrets, reminding us that evil knows no geographical bounds. Next up, we are heading over to Yuba City. On the surface, Juan Corona seemed like a regular man who was hired as a labor contractor at some fruit orchards in Yuba City, California. But what the residents didn't know is that things would very quickly take a dark turn. By establishing his own business, he became a crucial link between local farmers and seasonal laborers. But the tranquility of Yuba City was shattered in 1971 when farmer Goro Keichiro discovered a suspicious man-sized hole in his orchard, leading to a very grim discovery. Multiple bodies buried in shallow graves bearing brutal marks of violence. Corona, previously linked to a violent crime and known for his troubled history, emerged as the prime suspect. His connection to the victims, evidenced by receipts and chilling ledgers, alongside potential tools found in his home, formed the backbone of the prosecution's case. Despite an initial conviction being overturned, Corona was eventually sentenced to 25 life terms, marking him as one of a America's most notorious serial killers at the time. His repeated parole requests have been uniformly denied, which I'm sure we can all breathe a sigh of relief for. Next up, we are heading over to Visalia. In the small town of Visalia, California, a series of burglaries, horrifying crimes, and even a killing known as the Visalia Ransacker incident took place in the mid 1970s. But what if I told you that these crimes were solved decades later in a shocking twist? The perpetrator broke into homes, committed petty thefts, and escalated to violence, culminating in taking the life of Claude Snelling, a college professor trying to protect his daughter. These crimes terrorized the community and remained unsolved for decades until advancements in DNA technology linked them to a man, revealing the disturbing depth of his crimes across California. Many of you likely know the man who is most often referred to as the Golden State Killer. It is believed that these series of crimes in Visalia acted as a sort of training ground for the GSK before his later crime sprees that we are more familiar with. Next on our list today, we are heading over to Ketty, which is in Northern California. In the spring of 1979, Glenna Susan, or Sue Sharp, seeking a fresh start after separating from her husband, moved with family to Northern California near to her 
brother. Initially residing in a trailer, the Sharp family later relocated to a more spacious home in Keddy, a quiet Sierra Nevada community. This tranquility was shattered on a grim morning in April 1981 when a horrifying scene was discovered in their home, plunging the town into a chilling mystery. Sue and three others were found deceased under brutal circumstances, prompting a very complex investigation involving local law enforcement and even the FBI. Amidst swirling rumors and a few solid leads, the case unfortunately grew cold, haunted by unanswered questions and the specter of injustice. The community of Keddy enveloped in the shadow would absolutely never be the same, and the Sharp family tragedy unfortunately remains unsolved. Next up on our list, we are moving over to Eureka. It's, uh, Eureka is usually like, wow, that's amazing. Um, it's not right now. Unfortunately. Eureka is a town in California, of course, and it is located on the shores of Humboldt Bay, but this beautiful coastal city was met with a very dark cloud back in 2014 when a local crime involving a priest rocked the town. The priest was sadly found in the rectory of his church, and authorities quickly knew that foul play was to be suspected. The feeling of the city changed after this crime as people were unsure of how to respond or who could possibly be responsible for such a horrific crime. This was all fueled by the fact of where this crime had taken place, in a place of worship where members of the community went to feel safe or feel taken care of, and it was now a place of unspeakable evil. After thorough investigations by local law enforcement, a suspect came to light, a man named Gary Lee Bullock, who had recently been released from jail just days before this crime took place. In the end, Gary was put on trial and found guilty for his crimes. While he had tried to plead an insanity case, the evidence proving that after the crimes he attempted to destroy the evidence proved that he knew what he had done was wrong, and he was sentenced to two life sentences. Next up on our list we have Placerville. Nestled in the heart of California's Gold Rush region, Placerville, once ominously dubbed Hangtown, holds a treasure trove of history mingled with spectral whispers from its boisterous past. This town, a pivotal site during a friend epoch of American history proudly retains its architectural lineage, offering a tangible connection to the days when justice was often swift and harsh. As you stroll down its main thoroughfare, enveloped by the echoes of yesteryears, you can't help but feel the palpable presence of the Old West. Places like the Hangman's Tree Saloon and the historic Carey House Hotel are not just remnants of history, they are places where some say the spirits of those who once tread these grounds linger, unwilling or unable to move on. Next on our list, we are heading over to Felton. Picture this, a tranquil California town in the 70s, an era of peace and love suddenly becomes the place of a shocking event that shook the very foundation of the community. Enter John Lindley Frazier, a man whose journey from a troubled youth to a convicted individual is as bewildering as it is tragic. Once a high school dropout from Santa Cruz County, Frazier spiraled into a deep obsession with apocalyptic prophecies and environmental zealotry, convincing himself that he was a chosen savior tasked with a very grim mission. On an unassuming day in October 1970, the serene mansion of Victor Ota, a well-respected ophthalmologist, became the scene of a very chilling act. Frazier, armed and determined, targeted Ota's family and their secretary, leaving a trail of sorrow in what was once a home filled with laughter and love. The perpetrator's man Festo, a very bizarre note left in an expensive car, hinted at a warped crusade against materialism, a tragic commentary on distorted ideals. While the case eventually saw justice, with Fraser sentenced and later found lifeless in his cell years later, the incident remains a very dark stain on the narrative of a town caught between its idyllic past and the harsh realities of a changing world. Next on our list today, we have Covina, California. On a seemingly festive Christmas Eve in 2000, in eight, Covina, a town of course in California, became the home for a shocking and very tragic event. The Ortega family, known for their love of the holiday season, had gathered to celebrate, embracing the joy and togetherness that Christmas is known for. However, the night took an unimaginable turn when an individual dressed as Santa Claus arrived at their door. This was no ordinary holiday visitor. It was Bruce Jeffrey Parker.
Pardo, who unleashed a horrifying sequence of violence, leading to the loss of nine lives at the Ortega family gathering. He didn't just use firearms, he also employed a makeshift flamethrower, turning a scene of celebration into one of absolute devastation. Pardo's actions were not just a spree of violence, but a meticulously planned event rooted in a personal vendetta stemming from a recent divorce. Despite the meticulous planning, the night ended in Pardo's self-inflicted demise, adding a very grim conclusion to an already dark chapter. The incident left an indelible mark on the town of Covina, transforming a date meant for joy into a memory of loss and sorrow. Next up, in a much lighter turn of events, we are heading over to Idlewild, California. Nestled amidst the towering pines and rustic cabins, Idlewild serves up its own unique cocktail of natural beauty, mingled with the mystique of the unknown. It's not just a haven for artists and hikers, but also a hotspot for those intrigued by the paranormal and the arcane. Imagine sitting by a crackling campfire, the air crisp with mountain chill, when suddenly the night is pierced by inexplicable lights dancing in the sky. Are they wayward campers, a trick of the light, or something more mysterious? Whispers of occult rituals in the surrounding woods only adds an extra layer of intrigue, painting Idlewild not just as a picturesque retreat, but as a place where the veil between the ordinary and the extraordinary seems very thin. And finally, we are ending off our list today in Julian, California. In the serene town of Julian, known for its golden apples and rustic charm, there is a slice of mystery that rivals even its famed pies. As night falls over this quaint mountain retreat, some residents and visitors report witnessing mysterious lights weaving through the woods, an otherworldly spectacle that stirs curiosity and whispers of the unknown. Not only this, but a very peculiar phenomenon has been observed. Episodes of unexplained sleepwalking, where individuals are drawn towards the forest under a moonlit trance. These incidents, free from sinister undertones, paint Julian not just as a haven for pie enthusiasts and nature lovers, but also as a hotspot for those intrigued by the unexplained. It's a place where the ordinary meets the mysterious, adding an intriguing layer to this otherwise idyllic setting. <music>